Okay, so it's uh, recording. Um, welcome to part two of lecture five. Um, so in, in part one, before just before the break, I was explaining to you that the variation of the energy, the total energy in the hydrogen atom, um, as described by Newtonian mechanics, is given by this expression here. And uh, when you consider the variation of uh, the radius of the electron trajectory. And uh, what Bohr said was that, well, since the electron is emitting radiation, um, it is losing energy, and the energy that it loses must be equal to the energy of, uh, uh, of the energy carried by a photon. So he said that this delta E, which is the variation from one radius, the, the variation of the energy from one radius to another radius is given by H nu, where nu is the frequency of the emitted photon. And we have learned in the last lectures that you can write nu as C over lambda. So the variation of the energy, according to Bohr's idea, is H C over lambda. But according to the classical mechanical derivation, it is given by this expression, okay? So I can equate this guy given by this expression with this guy given by this expression. So if I say that this is equal to, equals to this, then you see I have HC over lambda and I will equate with this expression here. So I will move H C to this side of the equation, and this will give an expression for one over lambda. Okay, so if I equate this with this, I obtain that one over lambda is given by this ex this constant here. So you see that here we just have constants k that comes from the Coulomb's law, E, which is the charge of the electron, H, which is the Planck's constant, and C, which is the speed of light. And two, of course, it's uh, two. <laughs> so, and this will be multiplied by the inverse of our F minus the inverse of our I, okay? So you look at this expression for one over lambda. So this expression tells you what will be the inverse of the wavelength of the emitted radiation when the electron moves from uh, radial uh, R i to, to the radius R f. Okay? Um, now look at this expression. This is an expression of the type one over lambda is equal to a constant times this difference of inverse of, of radius. This is very similar to the expression that we were discussing when we discussed uh, uh, the spectral decomposition of the hydrogen atom. So if you go back to this expression, you see that one over lambda, again, the inverse of the wavelength is a constant here, is the readback constant times 1 over m squared uh, minus 1 over n squared. So you see this equation was obtained directly from an empirical uh, uh, um, ansatz. And now we are deriving this expression here from classical mechanics and we are saying that we can compute the wavelengths of the emitted radiation by the electron. So if Baumer is correct, and if Bohr is correct, then this formula here must be related to the previous formula. And how do I relate them? Well, I have to, call, to say that these constant k e squared over 2hc times 1 over r must be equal to the heat bag constant 
divided by those integer numbers that appear in the formula. Okay? So if it is Rn, then I will put n squared. If it is Rm, I will put m squared. Okay? So if Bohr is correct and Baumer is also correct, then this relation must hold. So look, look at this. This is very important. I am saying that the Hitback constant, which is a constant that was introduced just to tune the, the expression uh, proposed by Baumer, is related to other physical constants that we know. So this is a completely, um, 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 let's say, uh, you are really predicting the value of the Hitback constant by the combination of another constants that you know the value. So one way of seeing if this proposal by Bohr is completely nonsense is just to check if this constant here gives the correct value for the Hitback constant that was measured in a completely independent way. Okay. So in particular, I can write, I can put Rn to this side of the equation and put n squared to this side of the equation and rh to this side of the equation. So I can express rn as n squared times a0, and a0 is given by this expression here, which is a combination of fundamental constants that we know the value. Okay? This a0 is what we call the Bohr radius, and what I'm saying is that this is a very non-trivial result. What I'm saying that according to the model proposed by Bohr and its connection to Baumer's uh, expression, the radius that the electron can, uh, the radius of the trajectory of the electron is given by an integer number times A0. So the radius must be a multiple of the the electron radius sorry the uh, let me repeat the radius of the electron trajectory must be a multiple of the Bohr radius so i'm saying to you that not all radius or not, or not all radii are allowed for the electron okay this is what i'm saying so either the electron is at a radius which is equal to the to the Bohr radius, or it it will be at a radii that is just a number times the Bohr radius. So, look, this is this is again completely non-classical. So, from a classical theory, I can place the electron at some given distance from the the nucleus, and the electron will be rotating there. Now I'm saying that. If I postulate, if I say that the energy that the electron emits is quantized, namely is H nu, then this has a direct implication to the possible values of the radii that the electron can feature. So the quantization of the energy is implying the quantization of the radius. I'm saying that the radius cannot have any value that I want. The radius must be um, um, uh, a discrete set of numbers. Okay? So you see that um, the postulate that Bohr made, which was this one, that delta E is H nu, has a profound impact on the atomic structure. Because what Bohr is saying is the following. There is a minimum radius that the electron can have. The, the electron, when I say the radius of the electron, I'm not saying the size of the electron, but I'm saying the radius of the trajectory of the electron. When n is equal to 1, this is the minimum value that I can have for n, Rn will be equal to A0, which is the Bohr radius. And this is the smallest radius 
that the electron can have. As a consequence, the electron will never fall into the nucleus, according to this description here. So you see that imposing the quantization of energy immediately resolves the problem of uh, uh, the atom stability. Well, you can say, well, I mean, uh, this was just a guesswork. I mean, Bohr just said that the variation of the energy is H nu. And this, I mean, this, uh, this seems to, to lead to some reasonable results, but it could be totally different. That's true. But remember that this equation, this H nu uh, uh, expression, was already, I mean, present in a different phenomenon, which was the photoelectric um, uh, effect. And also at the description of the black body radiation. So this is not just a random guess, okay? Moreover, it has a profound connection with Baumer's expression. So this structure here is very, very similar to the structure of Baumer's expression. So what we are saying is that if Baumer is correct, and it must, I mean, the, the formula must be correct because it's just an empirical for equation. So it's something that you uh, derived from uh, the experimental results. So it's not something that you uh, thought about and try to, you know, predict something. It's, it's the other way around. And this equation here was derived to what, using just uh, classical mechanics and this assumption. And what we are saying is that if you combine these two results, you get this quantization of the radius. The, by quantization of the radius, I'm saying in the atomic model by Bohr, the electron can just have specific values for its um, for its uh, 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 for its trajectory radius, okay. But there is a key test that this model has to pass, which is the following: um, I have related the readback constant with another fundamental constant, and they were measured independently. So if this model is correct, then I can calculate the readback constant from other constants. And those results must agree. If they don't agree, then there is something with the model. Then this identification is nonsense, okay? Oh, sorry. And Okay, I, I, I'll just, I'll just, con I'll just answer your question, just a second. So, um, um, you see that um, if I take this relation, okay, and I express now the radius Rn as being n squared times a0, I can plug again back in this equation and write Rf, which I call I will call Rm, and Ri I will call Rn, and this expression becomes this expression here. So the difference between the energy uh, for the radius Rn from the energy uh, corresponding to the radius Rm is given by this expression here, okay? And as I said, Bohr related the heat back constant with other fundamental constants. And we knew the value of the heat back constant that was obtained by, uh, by the Baumer uh, uh, expression. And if this whole thing is consistent, then when I plug the results of the other fundamental constants to compute the heat back constant, I must find the result that was measured before. And it turns out that 
the, those results agree. So if you take the heat back constant, as in this expression here, written in terms of K, E, H, and C, you substitute K for nine times to the nine, nine times 10 to the nine. E, you just plug the electron charge, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Uh, H is the Planck constant that we have seen. It's 6.6 .6 uh, times 10 to the minus 34. C is the speed of light, three times 10 to the eight. You just replace this here and you obtain the value of the heat back constant, which was measured. This is amazing. I mean, you are explaining Baumer's equation by postulating that when the electron emits radiation, it should emit as the, the, the energy of a photon. So you are connecting everything. You are connecting the, the knowledge that we gain from the photoelectric effect with the knowledge that um, you gain from the Baumer expression. And you are now deriving an expression that says to you that the radius of the, the trajectory of an electron in a hydrogen atom is quantized. It assumes specific values that, are, that, that live in a discrete set of, of possibilities. And you relate the heat back constant with another fundamental constant. And when you compute that, you, the results just agree. So this was a very important uh, um, um, result coming out from Bohr's theory. And it was, I mean, really grounding the, the, the success of the quantum theory because we, are, I mean, you, would, you just applied a bit of classical mechanics and a bit of quantum theory from the photoelectric effect and so on. And things are giving a coherent picture from a totally different um, system. I'm not talking about um, the energy of light here. I'm talking about the possible energies of an atom. And of course, it is related to light because the atom emits light. But anyways, I mean, this, this discrete nature of the energy carried by light is transferred to the atom in such a way that they can explain the stability of the atom. And this is fantastic. I mean, it, you, are, you are just, you know, um, gluing together some different ideas and get a very, very nice result. Um, before I continue, let me see the questions in the chat. Uh, there is a question. How did you get Rn and n squared from the boss postulate and that of Palmer's uh, expression, which we have equated? How does Rf match? So, to, just to explain again, uh, this, um, what I did here was just to say, well, Baumer express, so here I call RF and RI, but I could call it, you know, um, one over RM minus one over R n, okay, and I'm just saying compare if I compare this with um, um, Baumer's equation. So this comes with this constant here, k e squared over two h c, and now if I equate this with Baumer's expression, then this must be the read back constant, one over m squared minus one over n squared, okay? So now if this holds, then what I'm saying is that k e squared divided by 2 hc times 1 over rm, this must be equal to read back constant divided by m squared. For this relation to be true, I'm making this association here. 
okay? If I now replace M by N, then M here will be replaced by N. And looking at this expression, I can write R M if I plug this, if I, if I throw R M to the right hand side and M and R H to the other side, I can write an expression for R M, which will be something times um, M squared. And this something I'm calling A zero, A naught. Okay. Do you understand now how those relations uh, appear? For the first one, uh, what is the second one? Yeah, hello. Hi. Um, I'm talking about the, the next page 23. You see that when we um, made a substitution, uh, let me see, when we made a representation, A naught is equal to K E squared all over 2 A C R H. Yeah, this A naught, yeah. And we wanted to plug it back to the, the boss postulate, which says that it's equal to some RH, um, RH into bracket one over RM. That is the next page, 23. Yeah. If we make RH the, the subject from here, we are going to get KE squared all over A naught to HC. And I wanted to ask, where is that HC when we made the, the difference? Ah, because so you want to ask in this expression here, where is HC? Yes, H. Okay, so you see that a naught is something that is k e squared divided by two h c r read uh, r uh, read back constant. Okay, r h. Okay. So I have this expression here. Okay. Okay. And so what I'm saying, what I'm doing here is the following. Uh, okay, let me erase that. So what I'm doing is the following. I Now I will write, uh, okay, let me move to this. You see that the energy, you remember that the energy is uh, minus one over two Ke squared, okay? This was the expression for the energy of the of the the system, right? I mean, we derived that here. Okay. Now, I'm just replacing um, r here by n squared times a naught. Okay, so if you replace R here from for N squared times A naught, then you're going to have K E squared divided by A naught times N squared, which is exactly what you see here. So um, it's not necessarily that the, the RH is what we are substituting over there. So, sorry, can you repeat? I'm just saying that the final um, show that we've got, so that is that therefore is equal to k is good over 2 a not all into bracket 1 over n squared minus 1 over n squared. So that k is good over 2 a not is not the rh with the Boltzmann's constant. That's not what we are trying to figure out today. Because so I thought this, when this... we have the a not is equal to, um, a not is equal to, K is got over two C H R H. We yeah. plotting it back. I thought we were rather making R H the subject and then substituting it back to the No 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 no. I'm just I'm just deriving an explicit expression for R 
in terms of a naught and n. And then I'm just plugging in the expression for the energy. So when I take the difference of e n with e m, then I get this expression here. That's all. Okay, so I'm just using the fact that I can write Rn as this expression here. So A0 is a quantity that I can compute because it's fixed by just fundamental constants. And I'm just plugging back in this expression for the energy. So I'm just replacing R by N squared A0. Is that clear? Okay, so if, you, if, if it's not clear, I mean, you can ask, ask again and there is no problem. Um, okay, good. D just, just a comment that this K is not the Boltzmann constant. It is the constant that appears in the Coulomb law, okay? Um, there is another question. Uh, in the context of Bohr experiment, does the attraction of nucleus also contribute to the shrinking of the size of the atom and the energy loss of the electron? So the attraction of the nucleus is, is contained, the information of this attraction is contained in this potential energy. So this potential energy exists because the charges attract each other. So we, we are taking into account that. Okay. But you see, um, if you have a circular motion and there is a force that acts on the radial direction and this circular motion is such that the speed is tangential to the, to the, to the circle, to, to the circle, then this tangential force will make, uh, um, will change the direction of this, um, of this uh, velocity vector, okay? And this is the effect of the acceleration. It will change the direction of the velocity in such a way that you close the circle, but you not simply push, I mean, Push or pull, pull, push. Yeah, it will not pull the electron um, um, towards the nucleus, okay? But of course, I mean, these charges, they exert forces uh, on each other. And this is contained in the expression for the, for the potential energy, okay? Good. Um, so, as I said, I mean, it's very, very uh, uh, satisfying and amazing that Bohr uh, could combine those results and make connection to Baumer's uh, uh, equation. But now comes a question. Um, you can say, well, if Bohr didn't know about Baumer's expression because Baumer's expression was derived just looking at the experimental data from the spectral decomposition. Okay, so this was crucial to make this uh, relation here. Okay, but let's assume that Bohr did not know anything about Baumer's expression. Okay, so how can could we discover that these radii here are discrete okay so we should find a physical principle to explain that okay and the way that bohr explained it was not explaining it for a more funda for, from a more fundamental explanation this is just explained when you go to the full 
quantum theory in its modern version. But what Bohr said was the following. Well, um, what happens is that, uh, so Bohr tried several explanations and the one that worked was the following. He said that um, in the motion around the nucleus, the electron could not have uh, an arbitrary value for the angular momentum. So remember, the angular momentum in a circular motion is given by, by the mass of the, of the particle times its velocity times the radius of the trajectory. So Bohr said, well, um, this quantity cannot have a continuum value. It cannot be a continuous quantity, but rather it must be a discrete quantity. And you can say, well, I mean, where is he taking this from? Well, of course, as I said, this is a postulate. This is not a, a more fundamental explanation. But um, there are some indications from what, where you can get this from. So the statement by Bohr was that the angular momentum of the electron was quantized. Namely, it was a multiple of a, of a number. And this number is h bar, is the Planck constant divided by 2 pi. Okay? And you can ask, well, why h bar and not h? Well, Bohr worked this over and over, and this is the one that gives the correct result. Now you can think, okay, but why the angular momentum and not something else? Okay. Um, of course, to understand that, we'll need to work things in more details, but there is a hint. Um, if, you, if I ask you what are the units of Planck's constant, you can say, well, uh, it's joule times second. So it's dimension of energy times dimension of time. And energy is dimension of mass times dimension of speed squared. Okay? If you work this out, and this will be an extra exercise for you, um, you can verify that the Planck constant actually has dimension of angular momentum. So, what Bohr uh, thought was the following. Well, since I have a constant, a fundamental constant, that appears to be crucial, crucial in the quantum world, which is the, the Planck's constant, then I will assume that, that the angular momentum must be a multiple of such a constant, because they have the same dimensions. And you can say, well, but why h bar and not h? Well, this was something that was necessary to make the, the calculations work. So Bohr really tried this explicitly, and it was trial and error. But you see that this is not just so random. I mean, h bar has dimension of angular momentum. So if you postulate that the angular momentum is quantized, then you get back to the expression that we discussed before, this one. This you will show in an exercise, okay? I want you to work this out by yourself, so I, I will not give you all the steps here. Uh, in other words, the atomic model, uh, as described by Bohr, was based on the postulate that the angular momentum of the electron was quantized. This would fix the problem of the atomic stability. And this would reproduce Baumer's formula. And this is really amazing. Um, but of course, I mean, um, we are still in the middle of this confusion of, you know, we, we, 
we trust classical physics and at some point it fails but we don't have a systematic framework that explains what we should do in order to do things correctly so Bohr was just confident about making this postulate because he could compare with Baumer's expression that in turn was an expression obtained by you know collecting experimental data so you can you can ask I mean why I mean why should I know that I that the angular momentum should come in discrete values and in order to understand that you have really to go to the modern quantum theory and we are almost there so the only thing that is missing and I think in the last eight minutes of the lecture I will discuss that because this is a very simple thing although I mean the expressions they are very simple but the idea is a revolution and uh, next time we're going to start the modern quantum theory so we we discussed along this week entirely week entire week that light has you know this wave behavior from Maxwell's theory but in certain situations light seems to be described by a, by a particle framework so light behaves as a beam of particles and in particular we have discussed that the momentum of a photon is the Planck constant divided by the wavelength but if you look to this equation there is something very very weird so on the left hand side I am speaking about the momentum of the photon so I'm talking about a concept that is related to a particle on the left hand side however I'm talking about the wavelength and the wavelength is a property of a wave but in any case I still use the wavelength in order to compute the momentum of this particle so this equation is is telling you that although the photon can be viewed as a particle you need information about the wave that you described before as the radiation in order to compute the photon's momentum so there is this dual picture sometimes you speak you think about the photon as being a particle but in order to define properties for this particle you use wave properties as the wavelength so this this French he was a PhD student uh, Louis de Broglie well people sometimes I, I don't know what is the most appropriate pronunciation but so I would say de Broglie but I don't know I mean I will I will say de Broglie so de Broglie suggested an extremely non-trivial uh, uh, thing he said well why should we just look at this duality namely uh, this particle description and this wave description just for the photon why can't we ex ex extend that to to the other particles so this was a very speculative uh, uh, statement so what he did he said well um, let's assume that you have a particle for instance the electrons the electrons were you know uh, treated as particles and nobody nobody had doubts about that so let's assume that you have an electron a non-relativistic electron so the momentum of this electron will be the mass of the electron times its velocity and what de Broglie did was to postulate that there is a wavelength so pay attention to that because this is a highly non-trivial thing there is a wavelength and then you can ask wave of what we don't know it's just a wave that is associated to the electron that has wavelength lambda and I compute that I define it 
by being the Planck constant divided by the momentum of the electron. In other words, this is H divided by MV. And of course, for a non-relativistic particle, the kinetic energy is given by half MV squared. And you can rewrite that as P squared divided by 2M. And just taking this 2M to the other side, you can write P as the square root of 2ME times the energy. And lambda, therefore, will be the Planck constant divided by this expression, by square root of 2ME. -E. So De Broglie said, well, I am associating to the electron, which is obviously a particle from what we know, a wavelength that is um, given by this expression. So this is a definition of the wavelength of the electron. And what he was suggesting is that as light, this particle, the electron, can have sometimes the behavior of a wave and not just of a particle all the time. And then you can say, well, but we never saw anything that suggests that the electron can behave as a wave. And in order to understand that, you could just consider an electron with energy of one electron volt and compute, just by replacing this equation here, what is the associated uh, wavelength. So if you plug in the mass of the electron and the energy of one electron volt and plug the Planck constant in electron volt, you're going to find that the wavelength of the electron is 12 angstroms. So it's extremely uh, small wavelength that we were not able to see, okay? But then you can say, okay, but I mean, there must be a way of really, you know, probing the wave nature of the electron when I, I go to very, very tiny scales. And we are going to see that this is actually the case. So the Broglie idea was that, you know, particles have this different, this dual behavior of wave and particles. And these waves are what were they, he called waves of matter, okay? And this is, I mean, when, when he, he, he wrote that, this was a very speculative idea. He was just bothered by the fact that the photon had this behavior and the other particles did not. So he was saying nature cannot be that asymmetric. And he, he proposed that this should be extended to all particles. And in fact, this is true. And this is the dual, uh, you know, particle wave behavior that is crucial in quantum mechanics. Okay. But we are going to understand these things better starting from next week. There is a cute thing that you can think about, but uh, I mean, I can explain that in the beginning of the next lecture, which is the following. If you take seriously that the electron in a closed orbit on a hydrogen atom can be um, described by a wave. So if you draw here a wave, since this orbit is closed, then you have to fit here an integer number of wavelengths. So what is the size of this trajectory? Well, it's just the size of a circle, 2 pi r. So this 2 pi r must be an int integer number times lambda, which is the wavelength. The wavelength is this distance here. So if I massage this expression here, I get, so if I, if I multiply the right-hand side by h and divide it by h, then I will get, I can, you know, play with this expression here, I will get that the product p r is equal to n h divided by 2 pi. But h divide, divided by 2 pi is h bar. And pr is the angular momentum of the electron. 
So what we obtain here is the quantization of the angular momentum that Bohr had to postulate in his model. So if you assume that the electron can behave as a wave and it's in a circular orbit, then you obtain back the Bohr quantization rule. So this is just a very simple observation and you might not take this too seriously. What you have to take seriously is the fact that you can introduce a wavelength for a particle by using this De Broglie wavelength formula, okay? So with that, we have collected all the elements of what is called the old quantum mechanics. And from next week on, we will start discussing a systematic framework that allows you to understand all these crazy things that we have discussed in this week in a very, you know, precise set of rules that you have to obey in order to find out a physical prediction for a system. Okay? So this is a very, very uh, interesting topic. And uh, it starts to, you know, give you suggestions how quantum theory is non-intuitive, but it's really a beautiful subject, okay? So with that, I am, I'm already a bit over time. I will close the session. I hope you can take a good rest during the weekend and we see each other on Monday, okay? So enjoy your weekend, stay safe and uh, see you on Monday.